Hello, I'm Jeremy Allaire, and welcome to The Money Movement, a show where we explore the issues and ideas in this brave new world of digital currency and blockchains. Um, what a week for crypto. Uh, I, I don't think we need to say too much about the uh, astounding uh, you know, growth and momentum in cryptocurrency globally this week. Um, obviously, a good timing for any conversation about crypto, um, but, but this week, I, I want to really try and take a wide lens on what's happening in the crypto world, um, uh, what the impact of crypto is on the world, uh, the sweeping impact, I think, that it's likely and already having on social, political, and economic systems. I want to talk about the role of Bitcoin versus potential new forms of synthetic global fiat stable coins. Uh, and ultimately, how can we preserve the core economic freedoms that inspire and underlie crypto today? A lot of big themes. And to uh, join me uh, this week in those conversations, uh, we have a, uh, a, a tremendous individual. Um, uh, Michael Casey, uh, who is one of the, I think, strongest big picture uh, thinkers uh, in, in the space. Uh, Michael's actually someone uh, who I met uh, you know, quite some time ago when he was just starting to explore um, you know, the, the, the kind of crypto space. And uh, he is currently the chief content officer at Coindesk. Uh, previously a special advisor to the MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative, author of The Age of Cryptocurrency, uh, and he's a, a veteran reporter on global macro and financial markets from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, very, very excited to have Michael with us today. Hello, Michael. Hey there, Jeremy. Great Happy to see to you. Here. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's always fun uh, having a conversation together. And, mm -hmm. and I think our Thank history you. of conversations goes back seven years nice. um, to December of 2013. Um, yeah. I, I, I like to start these conversations, you know, just usually on a slightly, um, you know, personal or individual note. And um, I know a little of this, but I think, I think uh, you know, the audience would be interested to hear about your journey uh, into crypto and, um, you know, I, 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 I've always thought of you as one of the um, very, you know, biggest big picture thinkers about the impact of all of this on the world. And you continue to do that so, so effectively in, in what you're doing today. But um, would love for you to just share a little bit about your journey. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe yeah, you, you do know a little bit of this story because it impacted, you know, you, you played a bit of a role in it. So, so um, happy to talk about it. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I was a journalist uh, at the Wall Street Journal. I, you know, was was running a, a group called the Digital, uh, to the DJFX Trader, it was a foreign exchange trading uh, news service. Um, uh, there was a the journal and uh, Dow Jones had set it up. And so I was you know, the currency guy and I'd sort of spent a lot of my time writing about macro themes. I'd lived in Argentina for six years. I was, you know, I'd write about bonds, debt and, and, and currency. That was my big thing. Um, and, you know, I just remember, it was the Cyprus crisis, right? Yeah. Uh, in um, mid 2013, and suddenly this thing Bitcoin emerged on my radar. I, you know, I really, I, I think I'd read about it in different places and thought that's just too weird. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, and then it popped up, and I was just, what is this? And so, you know, immediately in the ill informed mind, it's like tulip bubble sort of right. uh, conversation. There's nothing valuable there. What is this thing? I wrote a column that I that I think was. Uh, pretty ordinary. I, I, I look back, look, looking back, I, I, I cringe looking at it. I think, oh my God, how, how out of touch is this thing going to be? In retrospect, it isn't quite as bad as I imagined it, but it was certainly very, you know, really, really rudimentary. And I just, I think I basically said this thing is probably a, a, a you know, flash in the pan and you'd be advised to ignore it or something like that. And and then you and a few others, I think maybe you guys reached out to me and you, you basically had seen that I'd written it and then, um, set up a meeting and it was a uh you know a, a gathering of journalists uh who i think is who are just sort of dabbling in this stuff and uh we had a dinner 
and it, it, you you brought along a few folks there yourself uh barry silbert was there who you know now yeah. owns the company that, that owns this going desk and so i kind of work with barry now which is interesting <laughs> um and uh although very very important to stress as we always do about the church and state independence yeah. of going yeah. to right. he's clear. also a significant investor in circle so uh, right we, yeah we so both we have don't know where, the, where these you know disclosures have become but um you know barry was there raj Date was there which is really interesting to me you know he was uh, he just i think ended his role as the interim head of the cfpb that you know uh elizabeth warren had created and i was like what this is i thought this was sort of a crazy libertarian thing why would a guy who's you know, you know be working with elizabeth warren involved in this um i can't remember was mickey malka there or was it uh, jim Breyer? or there was some, some other Breyer, uh, yeah jim Breyer, right and then so there was a number of players and they were they were legit you know you had this you know rich history of entrepreneurship yourself and i was like Wow, these guys are kind of serious. What, what, what are they putting there? What are they dabbling in this strange technology for? So anyway, that was the first part of it. But then, as the conversation progressed, uh, one of you, and I think it might have been Barry, just started to talk about the the relevance to the to the developing world. Um, and because I had spent six years in Argentina, and I'd spent so much time trying to get my head around why Argentina fails, why does it have a crisis every ten years? Why does it have debt blow ups? I'd spent ages writing about the, 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 the debt restructuring at the time, um, you know, and I would sort of realized that it was an institutional problem, that they had this core breakdown between the society and its institutions. And I, you know, I, I'd written quite a bit about it and I thought I had a pretty sophisticated take on it. Um, but I never, it never occurred to me that you could think about money outside of a structure in which government would run it. So I would, my, my analysis was right. always, uh, well, they've got to fix government. They, 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 have to, they have to get, you know, good right. institutions and they have to go, get, you know, have to get rid of corruption and, and, and everything else. And, and, I, and I realized that it was almost impossible because there was this vicious they cycle. sort of essentially make the government debt healthier. Is, right. is in a sense, is what you're what you're doing. That's it. That's so so that's you just need better politicians, right? And, and, and I recognized that was really hard because you had this vicious circle that where, you know, corruption in society, corruption in the government just sort of bred upon itself. Nobody paid their taxes because they didn't want to pay a crook. And so the thing was a constant struggle. Uh, and, and it meant that then they would always resort to these crises and bring in capital controls and everything else, right? Um, and, and then suddenly, you know, it just, it was just showing to me that, no, this is all about having a protocol that nobody could interfere with, that would then run this system underneath it, and that this would grapple with this problem of trust. Yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I was aware that there was this sort of problem of lack of confidence, lack of trust in institutions and everything else, that now we can build something that would, you know, potentially live outside of that. Uh, that is when, you know, as, as, as British and Australians say, the penny dropped, right? The, the light bulb went off. We, I was like, oh, I now have a context within which to understand this. And, and that's why, you know, when I, you know, wrote The Age of Cryptocurrency with, with Paul Vinny and others, had a whole chapter in there about my experiences in Argentina. Yeah, it's like the lead-in, I think. Right? It. Yeah, it began in the story about Afghanistan, but it was very early in the right. book. Yeah, it was. It was a way I use it as a framing to 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 talk about, you know, trust and and society and and the sort of the core issue of money as being this social covenant, you know, between yeah. the issuer in that case, the government and and its people, and and that this is a different way to think about that. So. Yeah, I mean that was that was it. Once I once I saw it in that context, I'd spent so much time. I, I like to tell people that um, if you want to understand, you know how how a monetary system works, go to a place where it doesn't work. Right, you, sure. you get to sort of expose all of the elements of that that need to be in place for something to fall apart. And then, of course, we had the financial crisis, you know, in the U.S. That I, you know, everywhere in my career, I've sort of been following crises everywhere, yeah. and. Uh, so that then just sort of realized that, hang on, this can happen anywhere. And, and then you start to put this into a much bigger context than just, you know, Argentina or Venezuela, but literally the structure of money. money yeah, so. yeah uh, that's, that's powerful. Uh, I, I want to come back to a few dimensions of that, actually. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, as, as, as you may remember, too, as in those early days, one of the things that really animated us was, yeah, this sort of this idea that there'd be a, a kind of synthesis or a hybrid of you know what we saw as digital currency and all the attributes that it presented technologically in terms of running as a decentralized infrastructure 
Um, and you know, how could at least reserve currencies live in that world, intermix with that world? Um, you know, as, as you know, like our first attempt was like, how do you basically tunnel, you know, uh, dollars and euros and pounds over the Bitcoin network, like saying, hey, we've got this global network. Um, so we're going to come back to it. I think this interplay between fiat uh, and, and, and crypto and, and, you know, the, this now much bigger world of digital currencies that, that is uh, uh, always in, in relation to and in contrast to Bitcoin, but also, uh, you know, has its own, you know, narratives as well around it. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I, I love, I love the book and I've loved your writing over the years. And I think um, the, uh, you're a great storyteller. Uh, as well as uh, you know, a great journalist uh, and, and 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 very thoughtful. I, I always think you know, looking at the impact of this through real world stories, um, as you were describing just a moment ago, kind of like the real world scenarios that w would drive a need for digital currency like Bitcoin and, and, and others that have emerged. But now you know, as you're uh, however many years through your journey, having covered this. Mm. You know, what what are a couple of really notable, impactful stories that you can think of where, you know, you know, Bitcoin specifically, crypto more generally, has been transformative to a person, a society? Um, you know, there, there, there's so many incredible mm. stories out there, but maybe maybe you could just share, you know. Yeah, you know, look, yeah, why not? I mean, I, look, so. Uh, the easiest ones to call on are ones that we, you know, deliberately sought out for the two books that we wrote, right? One, one of which was, um, you know, the age of cryptocurrency, which was really more specifically about Bitcoin and, and sort of some of the spin-offs from that. Um, and then the truth machine, which looked more deeply at, you know, blockchain technology and, and various other, you know, non-monetary applications. Um, so I'll, I'll start with it. The, the lead, the, the opener to the age of cryptocurrency. You know, we deliberately chose a story uh, about um, these girls who were uh, working out of an Afghan school, and they um, th they were working for uh, a, a project called the Film Annex, which had uh, videos and blogs, and it was like this sort of network of independent bloggers. And, and they were actually getting paid. There was, um, you know, there was a certain amount, a small amount of income that was generated and this system was like there was a bunch of freelance people. And so they, they, they brought in these students in Afghanistan to contribute blogs about their life. And, uh, and some of it was video and some of it was blogs, I think. Um, and Francesco Rulli, who was the, 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 the CEO and founder of that, you know, figured, how am I going to get money to them? Because if I'm going to pay them, um, You've got this patriarchal system, right? Um, where if you know if you just sort of wire them money or send them a check or whatever, they can't get a bank account. They have to go to the bank with their, you know, their dad or with their their, their brother. You know, there has to be a man involved in that in that system. Yeah. And and so this was a mechanism to to empower them by sending money directly to to them. And I thought that was really really powerful because totally. you recognized. The intermediary there, the bank, and then the, the, op the opportunity that an intermediary brings for other power structures to come in and take charge of that, right? If you substitute, you know, your da the dad or the brother for the government, right? Or, or you know, for or some sort of KYC regime or you know, whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. There's, well, you know, the Chinese government or the Venezuelan government, whatever it is, there is there's an opportunity for the, that power structure to intervene when there is an identifiable, you know, and, and, and controllable intermediary such as a bank. Yeah. So, so the idea that, that that to me was a really powerful way to talk about the power of peer-to-peer -peer exchange, because you just remove that capacity. So that was a really, that I think was really important when I think a lot of people who've read the book, you know, felt that that was a great way to start it. And then the other example I want to use is the story that um, we told uh, at the end of The Truth Machine. Um, and, and this was sort of the play on this concept that I think is really powerful as well about a blockchain as uh, a, a, as an immutable record of history. Yeah. Um, and and if, you, if you take the word history and you start to build that into it as as something about you know, hey, you know, throughout history, uh, the the stories that get told about ourselves are things that um, have always been 
manipulated by the usurpers, right? The next regime comes in and the first thing they do is they burn all the books or they shut right. down the library or whatever. Like the fact, you know, and, and throughout, he said, that, that's just been an element of control, right? Pol Pot goes back and sets the year back yeah, to zero, right? right? And the internet um, started to change that, obviously, and then blockchain is sort of like the next right. level. Yeah, right? and the, internet, the internet did start to change it, but yet we still have these vulnerabilities, right? We, we yeah. know that there isn't uh, the permanence to it. Um, you know, there, there's these, there are these servers that show down. I mean, I, I, I used to have a, a blog uh, when I wrote my first book, you know, back in 2009, called, the book was called Che's Afterlife. It's got the image of Che Guevara, completely different sort of, yeah. sort of circumstances. But I, I, I just forgot to maintain it. The host went down. Right. That, that gone. 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 I, I, there's a way back machine that I have to go. It's, it's really, really frustrating. Um, but the thing that's really interesting about this, right, this idea that you, now there is this permanent record of history, right? And um, yes, it's all in you know hash form and so forth, but you 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 have this mechanism. So so we started to just explore that as a concept and looked at the um, there's this you know there's Bitcoin graffiti as a service, right? Uh, now I, I, you yeah. know, it, it, it's these days I don't think you can actually write very much into a block itself. It becomes a rather expensive thing, but you you nonetheless had these mechanisms to to record information in there, and then we just sort of got searching through the kinds of messages that people throughout the, the years had left in this blockchain graffiti service. And you start to see some really powerful things, right? There's people leading, leaving dedications to uh, their lo lost loved ones. There's you know, some really mundane stuff as well. But the one that really struck me was a couple of messages from a 14 year old um, in, in Syria mm. at the time that Aleppo was under siege. Mm. it was like this plea for help and they were just like recording this plea for help in the blockchain and it was like what's going on there right it, it's like it, it's this statement of my humanity right? i need it's it's this is the way i interpret it yeah. right i need to record this for posterity because i need to know that, the world to know that i was here and and the idea that you have this record that can, can sort of in some way be that it's a very abstract concept of course it, you know we tend to think what is the practical use of these things but i like to go to that place sometimes and just think about yeah. it as, as something that does that so there's a there's a project i heard about the other day that's about re recording in ipfs uh i think it's called the starling project um the 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 stories of holocaust survivors right mm. it, it, you can see why it starts yeah. to get really important that you would you would actually capture this stuff in that way. And this is this is one of the great great promises, right? Is is Im immutable records and um, and you know and obviously the, there's a lot of innovation in in blockchain protocols that that can do can do that more scalably. And and so the, the, there are profound implications uh, from that. Um, and there's some negative ones as well. Cool. One can think of as well, but. Um, yeah, I, I, these are great stories, and I, I guess they they sort of touch on this theme that um, you know these open networks with with uh, whether it's information artifacts uh, or or digital money um, or non sovereign digital money um, have very profound like social and political implications, and I you know I, I think um, that was I think very very apparent uh, to a lot of people very early on. And, 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 you know, I, I remember many years ago talking about, you know, th there will be, you know, kind of bloodshed in countries because people are going to be voting with their smartphones, what economic system they want to participate in. And it's going to be going against the, the wishes of, a, of an unsex unsuccessful regime, whether authoritarian or, or otherwise. And that, you know, just like the Arab Spring uh, was sort of this new freedom of communications that had emerged with social media and, and messaging, you know, kind of unlocked uh, these in incredible aspirations for people who were, were seeing freedom in a very different way. And I think participating in economic freedom is, is very profound. And I think we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're beginning to see some of that emerge and you have to wonder as as non-sovereign you know digital currencies like bitcoin grow into the trillions in value as you know um they they you know, as, as a a wide sector of society around the world starts to store value there 
um, th that undermines political power. Um, and, uh, and then the economic freedoms of people being able to transact peer to peer on the internet, you know, also threatens, uh, you know, political power. And we're starting to see some responses to that. You're seeing these very, you know, very strong words out of say the German finance minister out of the G7 meeting last week that we must maintain absolute control of the state over the monetary system. Uh, I mean, very emphatic, impassioned, you know, this is, um, and, and you're seeing the voices get louder. I think you're seeing the uh, potential uh, kind of, uh, you know, rules by fiat, uh, not the fiat yeah, <laughs> like right. uh, money, exactly. but, but the yeah, fiat yeah. as in like, do what I say, yeah. um, you know, emerging and this, this sort of tension um, and, you know, you can, you can see a world where, you know, uh, political sovereigns do not want that those young girls in Afghanistan to have the ability to transact directly. They want everybody to be observed um, and, 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 uh, and identified and authenticated by a financial institution. And we're really starting to, to run up against that. And I'd just love to hear your thoughts on, um, is this movement and, uh, and, and you know, those that value these, these digital bearer assets uh, going to increasingly run up into conflict with, with governments and, and, and these, some of these established political institutions. And I'm not just talking about the United States. I'm obviously talking about everywhere in the world and in a lot of places where potentially, you know, sovereigns are, are failing financially. One could argue <laughs> that almost every sovereign is failing financially by some measure these yeah, days. Yeah. But, um, you know, what, what do you see happening what do you see happening? Well, uh, it's like such a huge, huge, huge question, right? Because I think that this is this is this is the biggest of big picture stories. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, money is about power; always has been. Um, you know, so, the sovereign and and money have have been intrinsically linked for for millennia, and and therefore, um, you know, we've got this you know modern monetary theorist out there that sort of mm -hmm. tell us that there's only way that money itself is defined by a sovereign, right? And I don't think that's the case. I, I think money is a is a tool. Um, it is is a system of exchange that society generates, and yeah. inevitably, therefore, it you know it, it intertwines with the sovereign. But the big question then is like you know uh, what are we talking about then? Is there a new concept of what the sovereign is in a in, in a sort of a decentralized, uh, open, internet based digital world? Right. Uh, you know we can't really separate. Right. And this isn't know, just about money, right? Like it's, like, not, it, you it's know, about the know. challenge to the nation state. I mean, let's just talk. Yeah, about exactly. this is, and this is where people like no one wants to go there because like oh that's just ridiculous, right? And, nation, and it is. These are the most powerful institutions in the world. It's a it's you know I, I but but look it's an imagined concept, right? I, I was. I studied at Cornell under, under, under Benedict Anderson, who was you know, this brilliant uh, political scientist, anthropologist who wrote a book called Imagined Communities. And, and he just, just, it's when you realize that we've embedded these ideas into our heads, but they just imagine, right? There's nothing that yeah. makes me any more, I, I, you know, there are plenty more people in other parts of the world right. that I have so much more in common with right. than some, some guy you know, in Indiana right. necessarily, yeah. right? And so, so, so that the, the nation states are constructs, and 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 therefore that the stories and the narratives that go with them have to be really, really powerful. When when we build systems that allow us to connect outside of that, yeah. it's all under under threat. So that's that's the framing for this. And that's that's sort of been the arc of the internet in many ways. Has been I mean I mean nation states are as as, as powerful as ever in some respects, but the sure. internet is this overlay yeah. on the globe that has created new forms of institutions that are entirely exist in, in, in software. And, and, and I guess like blockchains uh, allow for the establishment of new microeconomic units of organization uh, and, and that, that have many of the attributes of like a joint stock company or, or, or other things. And so adjudication moves on chain, other things happen. You, you will see this overlay of social and political structures uh, and economic structures, right, that exist truly outside of the nation state. Um, and and it, it seems, there does seem some inevitability to that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, do, I don't think it does mean it. I'm not, I'm not here predicting something as, 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 as huge as that, right? But I do think the tensions that come along these lines will, will shape geopolitics in particular. 
so so I think one of the things I'm I, I would my best case scenario for this because let's be clear I mean I, I wrote this piece the other day which I called you know Bitcoin you know the biggest of big shorts you know that yep. you're, you're basically shorting the global financial system in the same way that you know the big short against yep. you know the housing market happened in, in 2008 um but the, but the point I was making was that you know you're not therefore just hoping for dystopia it, it, you, you treat the short as as a signaling mechanism and hopefully what it does is it it, it doesn't we actually fix the system because the last thing we want is the whole thing to collapse right it would be yeah it would be well, right um but you do want governments and others to recognize that, that there's this call for economic freedom there's a call for change there's a yeah. there's a need for change that's being signaled by the by the prices that you're seeing and things like yeah. twenty three thousand dollars overnight you know so so the um that's what you want now what i think where i think the tensions are going to most emerge is in china versus the us so we, we do know that you know, china has for some time wanted to internationalize the the un the, the remit mm -hmm. and um now they have a technology that, that that in many respects could allow them to do so and it, you know i i think one of the most under uh, misunderstood or at least undercovered aspect of what you know programmable money could be and whether it's stable coins like the ones you guys work on or, or bitcoin itself or you know a central bank digital currency a digital bearer asset is the capacity for interoperability yeah. across currencies yeah. and therefore the idea that you know china uh, could say set up an arrangement with russia and you could have all sorts of you know powerful smart contract structures that would lock in exchange rates absolutely and, and 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 then why do you need the dollar as the intermediary, right? So that so the idea of the dollar as this central player in the global financial system is essentially being challenged, and that is hugely challenging to the United yeah. States. But the, but the thing is, what what I would love to see happen, I don't see it happening, sadly. But I would what the, the way that we could think about this is is a really if you had a really forward thinking, you know, U.S. administration. That went back to the mindset that it took in the 90s, right? Post Cold War, the internet was coming on board. You I mean you were there at the beginnings of this, right? There was the Telecom Act of 1996. I remember I was in Indonesia at the time. I was living in Jakarta, covering Indonesia, and we had a visit from Andrew Card, who was at that stage, I think, running the FCC. And he came in and it was said, "Look, we're here to convince everybody to sort of sign up to this, right. you know, new open protocol, open system. access." Yeah, open yeah. access this is because this is in the united states interest right it's we, in everyone's interest <laughs> it was and, and it was a it was the free trade era we just come out of you know, absolutely gap, gap had been signed that was that was, was a, the major drivers for globalization and and mm. you know, we're, 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 there's a lot of obviously the debate about 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 that but i, I i'm with, i'm with you on that and I, I i think this idea of a a very forward-leaning administration that is thinking about like what is this new global economic structure? How is it operating in this world of the internet? How is it operating in this world of digital currency? Embracing that. Um, I mean, my, my view is, you know, the, you know, these digital currencies, they, by definition, they just exist everywhere the internet exists. I mean, it's just, it, it, that is just a fact. There are no borders. It, you know, once it's instantiated as a, in it, with a cryptographic primitive, in a bearer asset that is connected to software on the internet, it is it is inherently global. It's inherently, as I like to say, intergalactic, uh, <laughs> wherever the internet goes. Yeah, I mean, so, the effectiveness. I think we need to remember, of course, so that you know, network effects matter, and like you know, absolutely. And we can spin up a digital currency anywhere, but like, will it have traction? And this is where the yeah, and this and everything else really matter. This sort of ties into um, you know some of the other themes here that I, I want to talk, talk with you about. So, you know, Bitcoin is at. Uh, I mean, we can always check in real time. I mean, it's at, you know, $23,000 uh, today, which is obviously dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this wall of, of institutional money, corporate treasuries, you know, absolutely some of the largest players in global macro investing. Uh, this is a very different situation than we've seen, you know, in the past. And, you know, per your column last week, is this, is this, uh, is this purely like, uh, a global macro hedge instrument. Um, you could argue it is, but obviously, it is a transactable currency, uh, and it and it has some very very powerful attributes that are very different than other historical kind of you know purely financial assets or hedge assets, um, and and that makes it 
quite different. Um, there's been a meme I've been seeing uh, just in the past few days on on crypto Twitter, um, really saying, you know, gold is not really the right uh, market to think about uh, what what Bitcoin is disrupting. Um, it's it's actually the hundred trillion dollar sovereign bond uh, industry yeah. because effectively the hundred trillion dollars of value that are in sovereign bonds are basically you know this underlying fiat denominated debt collateral uh, and and which are effectively you know negative coupons um, and so like people are, that's that's considered a safe store of value a hundred trillion dollars of a safe safe store of value and that's the market that's going to be disrupted when will central banks start to put digital currencies like Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Obviously, if corporate treasurers are, if financial institutions are, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time. And yeah, I mean, they are, in fact, because some of the some of these, uh, you know, nation states are mining uh, for their own account right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, Iran's doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think it's a, you know, this this sort of reserve currency question, I think, uh, you know, I remember obviously that was a mantra in in 2000 and, you know 12 2013 mm -hmm. and for many years. Yeah. And that Bitcoin could become a reserve currency. It, it, um, it featured in the in the, the latter pages of the age of cryptocurrencies. Yeah. So I mean, and, and it's certainly yeah. something that that yeah. I believe. I think um, it you know it seems a lot more credible right now. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, and and what are you know what what is that? you know what is the you know are, are we in are we in the space now are we in this space where that's a legitimate conversation and what are the implications of that for uh you know for for financial markets for sovereign debt for a number of other building blocks that sit on underlying uh you know a reserve assets yeah i mean i like i think we have to remember that you know, it still has to this, the scalability challenges are still there you know you know functionality there, there 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 is whether we like it or not a need where there are institutions participating in this world for you know an interface with uh, the legal system there has to be you know systems of custody and so forth you know whether we change those laws or not and so forth but but ultimately there's a lot that still has to happen to to reach that kind of a uh, uh, big enough global scale where you could imagine it becoming this underlying core collateral core core source of collateral but i i think that is if i if i now what i think you know, we all wondered what bitcoin was going to be right? i remember when i first writing about 2013 oh it would just become this thing that people would use to to buy cups of coffee and trade and it would become more money but you know ultimately all sorts of challenges to that but you know transaction fees confirmation times you know volatility all those sorts of things and now we're at this point, oh, it's digital gold. And so that just seems like rather boring. It's like, oh, it's just an alternative digital gold. But it is, it is so much more interesting for the reasons you point out that it has all of these other qualities and features. And, and, and the idea of you know, automated, uh, uh, you know, smart contract based collateral yeah. is, is incredibly powerful, not only because it, it, you know, it removes some of that, you know, counterparty risk and, and all the inefficiencies that come with the the existing legal system for how you securitize debt but but also because once you remove all of that legal layer you are once again disintermediating powerful entities and so you get the idea that we could collectively perhaps create these whole new frameworks yeah. for you know for what is a reference rate for example right like you know is there going to be a yield curve that is is entirely constructed by a defi that you know, so it's 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 a it's a fully decentralized yeah. libor. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, these these, these are these are happening organically, right? Right, yeah. they are. Now, will they be will they be sort of functional enough? Will they, will, will will the bugs be taken out of the smart contract? Will there be enough security and all of that? You know, there's so many these so many big questions. But it really becomes very interesting when you think about what where does this digital gold narrative go, right? Because then, you know, it it's I, I you know I, digital gold itself is like the it's like the human reserve asset, right? So you're right in the fact that the sovereign bond market is is maybe the biggest disruptor here, but but that but sovereign bonds or U.S. dollar based you know, treasuries are a reserve asset for governments, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're held by central banks, and that's Absolutely. the whole point. And that's the starting point for how the rest of the financial system is built. Right. The rest of us, you know, if you're you know a refugee from Syria and you and you desperately want to get out of the country, country, you know, before Bitcoin, you would get gold. And and you know and gold is the thing because that's your reserve asset. 
Right. But now this idea that we could actually have this human-based reserve asset, you know, Bitcoin, that doesn't have an intermediary in the middle of it, but it also has the functionality that you could apply you know, the existing financial system's rules on top of, then you start to say, wow, we, we, we could build a financial system that doesn't have these institutions in play. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it really is very, very big when you go there. I still think we have a long way to go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this pathway is, is still fraught with tensions. Like, you know, who's going to win, right? I mean, is, is, the, is the sort of cyberpunk economic freedom uh, drivers of this, are we going to build systems that actually uh, allow for a much fairer, more open economic system? Or are these huge Wall Street institutions going to get in and essentially dictate the development of this technology? You know, albeit, you know, this, the protocol will stay, hopefully at least, uh, uh, you know, independent because that's its, its pure design. Yeah, I mean, but sort of the on, on ramps and entry points, the idea that, that these powerful entities could start to have even more control over that may mean we're talking about a very different concept you know once once they're in play yeah i mean there's a lot to unfold there i i, I think um kind of leads to a, another theme here which is you know what are the what are the hybrid models that can kind of exist here and so you know we, we've we've made a big bet on on crypto dollars um and stable coins and uh you know sort of acknowledging that um you know Certainly, for the foreseeable future, uh, people are going to, you know, take their salaries and pay for rent and buy cookies and milk in in their domestic currencies. Cross border might become, uh, you know, uh, fewer currencies as are used today to settle transactions on an international basis. So that this that could accelerate uh, that. Um, but you know, uh, as one as one of my, uh, uh, you know, uh, friends out there in the industry. Guy Sheffield from Visa likes to say, you know, stable coins are uh, a new form factor for a dollar. Um, and, mm. and, and this, you know, you get the, all these attributes of, of digital currency, bearer assets, uh, global programmable additions, you know, you, you have all these things, but you know, it's, it's still backed by fiat. <laughs> um, it's, it's sort of backed by that underlying monetary policy, the Fundamentally, like the underlying, you know, debt worthiness, uh, credit worthiness uh, of, of of a sovereign, and so you can kind of, you know, you can look at them, you know, at, uh, if you're a, 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 a purist on something like Bitcoin, say, well, I would never, I would never want to hold my assets in, in that because you know all these reasons. But the transactability that's there and, and the reality of that, you know, um, do you see these kind of growing in parallel for maybe the next decade or or some period of time? Um, how, how do you look at that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, and, and, and not, you know, stable coins, uh, central bank digital currencies, of course, a different, you know, thing, a, a different structure. Um, I think there'll be a range of them. I mean, we, we're going to have, uh, I think we'll be moving into a multi-currency world. Um, it, it is, you know, the, the end of the Bretton Woods system, the end of, the, of dollar hegemony, which by the way, it was going to happen anyway. I mean, the, the, no, no, no reserve currency lasts forever. So, but I think now it's pretty clear that, 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 that when that happens, whether it's in 5, 10, 20, 50 years, we won't go, it won't be that the Chinese and NIMBY suddenly takes its place or the euro takes its place. It will be a multi-currency, right. digi digital, clearly the digital world, right? So in that environment, it's just hard to see it being anything but this kind of, sort of competitive thing, which Hayek talked about, right? This idea that we may actually sure. find better money in the money. world, right? So I, I see that happening. Look, I think... Um, it, it, what I think is really interesting about about stable coins from a, from this going back to this geopolitical perspective, right? Again, if we had this forward thinking U.S. administration, and they and they said, all right, we're just we're going to have to give up on on that kind of uh, uh, sanctions uh, uh, model, you know, where, whereby we control the dollar so that we can sort of shut out the Iranians and the and the Cubans and everywhere else and have have all those sanctions, but we have a much more open system. You know, and 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 let 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 like you know let a hundred stable coins bloom, right? You know, uh, it, it, you know, dollar back. You, you could imagine this being another sort of boost for the dollar, right? That there would be sure. that, that it's just another way of, of advancing yeah. U.S. seniorage, and yeah. it would be a huge challenge to China, which is you know is 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 trying to build an alternative yeah. has all these yeah. concerns about privacy and it's, and 
central, you know, centrally right. controlled system. So if there was a much more, you know, like, let's, let's build for an open system. Well, this of, is like, this is like you said, it's like 1996. And the answer isn't yeah. necessarily that the federal government needs to build a giant R&D operation to go operationalize some, you know, closed permission network that they're going to run and they're going to do yeah. that. The answer is like, how do you harness the, you know, open internet community, open source innovation, technology entrepreneurs, uh, uh, you know, kind of Silicon Valley entrepreneurship, uh, the, 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 the power and prowess of, of major financial institutions, all these to, to build this, you, you know, in, in private market driven ways, but with, you know, the right collaboration with the government to sort of make sure like the, the underlying safety and soundness kind of concerns or other things can, can be addressed. Um, seems like that's a much more realistic response uh, from the West, uh, from from the United States, uh, you know, presumably potentially from major European players as well, uh, uh, rather than you know we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna federalize it uh, so to speak. Um, but um, yeah, that that will be interesting to see. I, I I think like there's this connection point, and you were referring to it as well to the Bretton Woods you know institutions, and obviously. You know, the, the history of all this is obviously all really interesting, right? Because John Maynard Keynes uh, at Bretton Woods, uh, you know, in, in that period was, you know, pushing very, very hard post-World War II for an international currency uh, that could be gold-backed, uh, but that have had the, the implicit uh, acceptance amongst the leading sovereigns in the post-World world, the Bancor uh, yeah. proposal. Um, and because the U.S. exerted so much uh, economic and military power, we said, no, it's going to be the dollar. The dollar is going to be the reserve currency and it's going to be this fixed, this fixed exchange rate to gold. So it's the gold backed sovereign uh, currency, global yeah. currency model. Um, yeah. And yeah. That, that obviously you know, worked for a period of time. And then multilateralization happened with the changing dynamics of the global economy and you know, the government went bankrupt in the Vietnam War and, and then said, oh, fuck it, you know, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, de we're gonna depeg and now it's just whatever we say the money is. Right. So that's been, you know, the last 50 years. That's a very short period of time in monetary history, obviously. Yes. Um, yeah. And so I think legitimately now we're in this era where you've got a, you've got a new uh, potential reserve asset that's better than gold. Um, and you also have this ability for, you know, kind of fiat backed digital currencies to have massive global reach, you know, very, very easily, which does have these kind of spills over into these geopolitical kind of considerations. And so the real question I have been asking, and you alluded to it as well is, you know, will this inevitably lead to a new multilateral framework for the monetary system that is grounded in synthetic digital currency that is actually based on a, you know, uh, like the SDR proposal, but, but includes the Chinese yuan, includes the dollar, includes the euro, includes, uh, you know, potentially some other assets, but also includes a peg and or reserve ratio of Bitcoin. Like will the future global uh, currency that is the transaction-based currency that's used by everyday people. Will it evolve to something like that? And uh, you know, we uh, we've long felt that that could be uh, could be what emerges. Yeah. Look, I, I look. Everything's in play, right? I mean, I I think you know, if, if you're talking about these big titanic shifts in the global financial system, then then this stuff has to be part of it. Now, um, we had uh, Raul Pal uh, the other day on our. Um, our podcast. This is the Money Reimagined yeah. podcast that we do weekly. I do weekly with Sheila Warren of the World Economic Forum, and um, and so Raul uh, had, had really, I think, has made a really interesting insight into what happens when the the piper has to be paid from the COVID crisis, right? Where you've got yeah. all, and you alluded to it before, but all of these um, Matt, these big wealthy industrialized yeah. governments, nation state governments with massive debt that just, and, and, that, and what typically happens when you have debt and everyone's got debt is you, it triggers a currency war because because the only way out of it is yeah. actually to print money, right? And that's, we can ideologue, we can take ideological positions whether that's good or bad or whatever. It's just a function of what governments do because they have to, there's no other way to pay it. So so you, you print and, and that's great for you if you're doing it on your own because your currency devalues and basically 
all of your your imports, uh, your imports, yeah. the foreign, foreign governments, but sorry, sorry, foreign countries, your trading partners, they pay for it, right? They basically pay for your debt in that way because you undercut their their own producers, and that's how you that's how you get out of it. You monetize that way. But of course, if everybody's in the same situation, you get a currency war, and that's a disaster. And that's we know that from history. And you know, the, the depression was exacerbated because of that, and in many respects, it led to the Second World War. So, so you don't want this to happen. And Rao was like, okay, so the way out of this is, is for kind of mass coordinated money printing. So it's like a debt jubilee, yeah. but it's a debt jubilee by monetization, which of course still means that- That's been going on. I mean, QE is just, has been that. It but it's not coordinated, right? And so the- I, It was coordinated. somewhat coordinated. I mean, you know, uh, well, post 2008, I mean, everybody kind of got together and said, all right, we're going to, not only are we going to provide these sort of shared liquidity lines, but we're going to yeah. basically all at once, you know, shock and awe, everybody's yeah. everybody's going to zero or everybody's going to whatever it was um you know uh yeah. so so there is, i mean it's not it's, it's not coordination, but truly it's like where do you actually bring it to what level right and and yeah. and, 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 and and how do you stop it from just becoming this crisis because there were loads of currency war like challenges it didn't didn't manifest i mean but the euro went through a massive you know, almost broke yeah. up because of this right yeah. so so there's the so that so his point was like well what if you know? So first of all, one thing is like it, it, it is good for Bitcoin because it has to. If everything else falls, it rises against something. Yeah, something else has to rise against it. But but more importantly, um, what is the instrument that you would potentially use to settle all of that? You know, universally, and it could be some form of basket, you yeah. know, that currency model. So is it you know Mark Carney's idea, which is a sort of digital version of the Bancor, this you know synthetic hegemon that the IMF would create? You know, Raoul was actually thinking this is what the original man, the original version of Libra, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. could have actually played this role. And that's what one of the things that made it very interesting is it actually might be a tool for governments rather yeah. than a threat to government. But this is uh, the, the vision for center and, and which governs USDC is is specifically to evolve to multiple, uh, you know, stable coin digital currencies, uh, ultimately to create synthetic versions from that and and, and include Bitcoin. In, in the synthetics, uh, mm. because you know you, you need that you know underlying uh, asset as well. Would you create a basket of currency, like some sort of you know you'd run into the similar problems that that, that you know the Libra Association and Facebook? Yeah, no, I mean I think that that taking a long view, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think yeah. um, our view and the approach that we took was let's start by focusing on reserve currency, digital, di di you know, stable coins. Um, and and then also include uh, over time even emerging markets where there's so much power in real time convertibility uh, from a trade perspective and a, and a and a commerce perspective. There's so much power in real time convertibility, um, and you know and and grow from there. Um, and uh, you know I, I think um, you know we, we you know we just hired David Puth as the CEO of Center, and he uh, you know he he ran. For six years, the largest infrastructure in the world for how currency is settled at CLS mm -hmm. and you know, two trillion dollars a day, 70 percent of the settlement of FX globally supervised by 23 central banks and the biggest financial institutions of the world in that consortium. Mm -hmm. I think stable coins at scale will become that kind of systemic infrastructure. Um, but it, you know, figuring things out like what is a synthetic basket and how you do that, you got to do that with governments. You're not going to just do that, you know, yeah. as a as a large internet technology company. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think you know the building blocks are there to get there. But um, I, I know we're uh, we're running up against time, um, and and this is obviously we could just go on for hours uh, on any one of these topics or subtopics. Um, I have to uh, I have to always play the the market cap game. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and ask you, all right, today, Bitcoin is a whatever, roughly 420, 430 billion dollar market cap. Ethereum is a 75 ish billion dollar market cap, you know, in five years, uh, you know, what does that look like uh, on, on, on those? And then, you know, what do you think the total value of, of stable coins in circulation aggregate of all fiat stable coins, uh, not just US dollar stable coins? Um, and I'm not including central bank digital currencies. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the, the sort of uh, more pure digital currency uh, stable coins. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think that looks like in five years? 
uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not to be much of a, of a, of a fun, uh, uh, you know, competitor in this game because, you know, I think mainly just because as a journalist and, and you know, working for Coindesk, sort of anything that looks to sort of like price numbers and a prediction of a market. Okay, price, you get a free pass. You get I'm a free kind of putting a price. What I will say is this, I, I, I think that, um, you know, I was always, you know, Winston Casares would say, look, you know, it's either it's either a million dollars or it's worth zero, right? And we still don't know which one that's going to be. And 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 and, uh, and and that's just not to say a prediction of a million. It's just literally this is the this is the, the binary price has this binary scenario. Um, I would argue that the we've certainly moved higher up in in recent times towards the confirmation of the the higher end, you mm -hmm. know argument here right i mean it, it just with the scott minard you know coming out and saying he thinks it should be worth four hundred thousand dollars and everything else I mean, people are people legitimate you know very very influential financial institutions and, and investors are, are saying things like that now and and so i think that that you know that that, that it's no longer you know a, a flip of a coin you know that there's a greater probability that this is really 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 valuable uh in the future but i i don't i don't like to put numbers and i certainly don't want to be implying that people should be pouring all of their bets into bitcoin at this stage it's, it's not it's not my thing yeah. um and I, and I don't know whether i'd be able to put a number on on, on global stable coins but i look I, I i generally think that you know it, it, it's people need this stuff and 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 the the, the more stress there is in in the system uh, and you know we saw for example in the the, the first moment of the COVID crisis that were, there was dollar shortages all over the world and so nigeria yeah. and these places right. had these problems and that's where bitcoin became you know yeah. powerful but they've there's also been this huge you know growth of stable coins in, in those sorts of places now extrapolate from those random places like venezuela and and uh and nigeria into a more global scenario where there is yeah. a crisis associated associated with the dollar itself Mm -hmm. And people are going to need payment vehicles that, you know, because the, the financial system, the banks are going to be under serious stress mm -hmm. and they'll need uh, alternative means of, of, of moving value around. And I think that both Bitcoin and, and stable coins will play a critical role in, in sort of resolving that, you know, infrastructure challenge that we're going to face. Yeah. In, in Argentina, by the way, another yet another perfect uh, example of that because when I was there, you know, where they shut down all the banks and people came up with barter systems to figure out how to check, how to move yeah, money, right. you know. So, so this is leading to something big. I don't know what the number is, but definitely, you know, it, it's it, it's on a it's on a trajectory that's pointed yeah. significantly higher. I'm I'm gonna confidently say in the trillions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, uh, but we'll see. <laughs> um, Michael, it's so great to have you uh, for this conversation. It's been you know, pleasure, Jeremy. great to continue the conversation over the years and look forward yeah. to continuing to do it in, in various uh, uh, forums and formats uh, as well. So I just really want to thank you for joining. Likewise. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I'm looking forward to many more. Excellent. All right. All right. So uh, uh, great conversation there with Michael. Um, really amazing times right now in in the crypto uh, universe, a um, lot of big themes, a lot of big implications. Uh, very excited to be char uh, chartering uh, uh, that and, and exploring it here on the Money Movement. This is gonna be our last episode of the year. So we're gonna pick it back up in early January. Um, and uh, until next time, stay safe, stay well, and stay informed. 